Welcome back to part two of this full stack tutorial series. Today, I'm just going to be quickly going over Docker and what is a container before we actually set up a Docker file. So Docker is actually just a runtime engine that lives on top of your operating system. So you can have it running on Linux or you can having, have it running on Windows. What it will do is allow you to actually containerize, so run your little app as a little micro server. So you'll have the ASP.NET Core app, let's say as app A, running on a Linux container running on our Windows machine. And similarly, we will be getting our SQL server and our Kibana server set up at the end of this tutorial, running all on our Windows machine and just being able to orchestrate it by pressing one single button. To get started with Docker, the first thing you'll need to do is to download Docker for desktop. So go to hub.docker.com. And once you're here, you'll need to create an account if you don't have one already. You can choose the free community account just so that you don't have to pay for anything. And when you complete it with those steps, verify your email, click sign in. Just enter your credentials. And then you'll be redirected to their login portal. So click get started with Docker desktop. And you'll just follow this link here and download their client. Um, it's going to be roughly around one gigabyte. So it just might take a while for you to download it. Once you've got that downloaded, go to your downloads folder, open this, and then just follow through with the installation. I'm just going to speed through most of this because it's pretty standard installation steps. So once you're done installing, just got to restart your computer and then run a quick little hello world to make sure everything is actually working. So once you've restarted your computer, hopefully Docker will be running. You'll know that it is running in your little manager here. You'll see Docker desktop is running. You can also see here that it's asking you to log in. This is optional. It will actually still work without it, but I tend to just log in anyways, just so that Docker doesn't bother me about anything. You sign in here. And one of the little gotchas I wanted to mention before um, kind of continuing is that right now Docker will only run in either Windows or Linux container. So you can see here that switch to Windows containers. This just has a limitation being that you can only run one or the other and not both at the same time. Now, if you do want to run both at the same time, there is something called Docker toolkits you can run that uses VirtualBox as its virtualization tool, and it will actually allow you to run both, but there are some gotchas with that as well. Now let's verify Docker is actually running correctly. So what you're going to want to do is open a terminal. I'm going to just full screen and zoom in so you guys can see a little bit. What you want to do is type Docker just to make sure your CLI is actually running correctly. And it looks like it is for me. So I'm just going to clear that. And I'm going to run their Hello World application so you guys can see. And you guys should probably do the same just to make sure that your Docker is actually set up correctly. If it is working, you should see the following. The first one will tell you that you do not have the Hello World image installed. So it's going to then pull that image for you. And once it does, it's then going to just execute it for you. And you can verify that that actually was ran as well. But if you type Docker, Yes, all, which will tell you all the one Docker images that have been running. And if you type Docker images, you'll also see the list of images you have. Now that it's your first kind of Docker setup, or if you've been using Docker previously, you kind of want to clean up all of this because you don't really want to see a hello world every single time you type. So you're going to type Docker RM for remove, and you're going to type the container name to remove the container from your work in process. So in this case, mine is 89. You don't have to type it all. You'll just do a wildcard match. Press that, and it'll tell you that 89 has been removed. So if you type Docker PS all, and then it'll show you that that has been removed. The so same idea with the images, except for remove image, and you type the ID right here. So BF, type that, and then type Docker images, and it'll tell you right here that all your images have been removed and everything has been cleaned up. Back in Visual Studio, if you have the project open, I'm going to show you a really useful tool when having containers. So go to view, 
other windows and then you want to click on containers and this will open up um, this little containers tab down here and you can actually see all of the images that you have installed or all of the active containers you have running and if you want you can actually remove the image or remove the container so the good thing about visual studio is they have actually worked on their docker support pretty well so what you have to do is on your project level right click go to add and then you want to add docker support then you want to choose your operating system. I usually use Linux and you can use Windows if you want. And remember, if you are on a Windows machine and you select Windows, you have to go to your Docker engine and switch it from the operating system if it's not already set on the one you desire. I'm going to choose Linux. Press OK. And then it's going to produce a Docker file for me. So let's just open that up. Just zoom in first, just so you guys can see a little bit better and kind of go over it. If you want to actually go through Microsoft's documentation to explain what it is, that's probably a good resource to check out. But what it's going to do is use two images here, one to run the application and one to actually build the application. So up here, it's going to set the running application. And you can see that it's using a slim image so that your runtime is actually smaller. Let's quickly set a working directory, which will be a app folder, which all of the binaries that will be published later will be copied into. And it's going to just expose your HTTP and HTTPS ports. And these are the default uh, ones set out if you don't know that. Next is going to switch your image to actually use the build image. And they use aliases here to kind of keep track of things. Just going to make a working directory and then it's just going to copy some of the files over. Do a .net restore, copy more files over change your working directory to the ones that you have just compiled and then do a build on it. And then you can see here that it's going to run a release and it's going to set the output to an actual app build folder. The next thing it's going to do is actually publish. So publish is the final output that you want to copy to your runtime server. So it's just going to rename the alias from build to publish just so it can kind of keep things a little bit more clean. And it's going to actually run .NET publish on that same project. So the difference between build and publish is this one is actually just going to be your final final release candidate. And you can actually um, not set an output here and just let it do the default. But Microsoft wanted to keep things consistent and kind of keep it in a nice organized way. So here, this final output in the publish folder is what you're actually going to be copying to your runtime. So you can see here that it's going to then take the base, which is the runtime image, and just rename it to final so that you know this is the final step of what it's going to be and the final image that's going to run. Then it's going to once again switch your directory to app. And this is going to copy from publish, which is this image's name. And it's going to take everything inside that app publish folder, which is right here. And it's just going to copy to its local directory, which is now set for app. And then the final thing it's going to do is it's going to set an entry point. So what does it need to do when the Docker image spins up? And as you know, you can set the CLI to go .NET and then set the DLL. And what that will do is kick off Kestrel and actually run the application. Now let's actually run the Docker image. So if you can see up here, the Docker profile has actually been added. So if you click up here, you can see that this profile has been added. And previously we were using the rest of the book API. So let's run it. And if you haven't downloaded the image already, it's going to take a little bit longer just to download the image. But you can see that it's ran the Docker image and it's going to assign a port for you. And this is the URL that ran. So like before, we go API key, we should get our fake API key. I'm just going to stop it here. Now I'm going to stop the debugging. Now we should see in our little containers area the image we have created you can see here that the recipe book api has been made um, it sets some environment variables for you and it's actually should have the image created for you so every time you you run this docker file it's going to build that image and it's going to save that image for you so that it can be reused over and over again in your container now, as the system gets a little bit more complex, you can have a bunch of different microservices. So you are going to have a bunch of different Docker files. You can either run it as a multiple startup project, which you will target each one of them. But then you're going to run into situations where the target project itself won't actually exist. So it'll be like a third party server like SQL Server that you can actually, you know, right click set as starting project. So you, what you want to do is you want to add a composing 
orchestrator. So in this case, we're going to use a Docker Compose file. And luckily for us, Visual Studio has a built-in tool to also do that. So we're going to right-click, and we're going to add, and then Container Orchestration Support. We're going to click this, and I'm going to choose Docker Compose. With that, you press OK. Once again, choose your operating system. I'm going to choose Linux. And just give that a second, and you can see here it's going to create the Docker Compose file for you. So I'm going to minimize this, and then you can see that the Docker Compose file is actually bolded. And when it's bolded, it means that it is the startup file. And then you can switch back to this if you want. But I'm going to use the Docker Compose file and show you guys how to actually run that. So let's open up the Docker Compose file and take a look at what's inside. If you are new to this, I know it's kind of overwhelming because you have a bunch of files everywhere. But after a while, this actually becomes pretty trivial. Inside of our Docker Compose file, you'll see the um, header called services. So what this is telling you is that you're going to be listing out a bunch of different microservices or servers that you have. In our case, the Visual Studio app actually, or Visual Studio tool actually scaffolded a recipe book for us. And it knew that we um, set up the orchestration from the Docker file since we right-clicked and added Docker or orchestration support from there. And it will build out this image for us and then follow out the instruction set of the Docker file. So this doesn't really look too um, useful right now because we only have one file. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually copy another server over just so you can kind of see the long term usefulness. Let's copy over our next service. So I have this. Um, so what I've done here is I've copied over a SQL server uh, service and it's going to use the official image from Microsoft, set up some variables, set up your volumes and set up a port. I'll go more in depth into this in a future video. For now, just know that we are actually just creating another server on the fly. And what we want to do also is actually add this. We want to say that before we actually spin up our API server, we want to have our SQL server spun up. And this is more so that you don't have to run this. And then when you're trying to perform a get or something, this you actually don't have your database ready because in a typical workflow scenario, your database would already be installed somewhere and you don't really have to think about it. But when you're composing everything on the fly, you want to make sure that your dependencies are set correctly. Now let's actually run the Docker Compose file. So similar to before, when we had our profile change from recipe book API to Docker file, we now have a Docker Compose. So what I'm going to do is first make sure that we clean up everything here. Because now that we swat from Docker file to Docker Compose, we probably have some things left over. So you can just really easily remove everything, make sure we have a nice clean state, just so there's no collisions with ports or anything. And I'm going to just make sure I just here. OK, so these are the root images that we have. If you delete these, you'll just wrap, you'll just spend a little bit more time redownloading them. Now we have a clean state. And let's actually run our Docker Compose. So it's going to, once again, pull images, build. And then here, you're going to see all of the, uh, all of the containers sorry, that have been set up. So our recipe book API have been set up again. And then additionally, now you can see that Docker Compose has set up a SQL server. And you should now see our recipe book uh, API because once again we've used a Docker file but you don't see is a SQL server because the image that we've actually used is the root SQL server image and we didn't actually override it so that's why we don't see a SQL server image but we do see a recipe book the final thing we want to do is just clean up all of the stuff we have here so that we can get ready for the next videos so I'm just going to undo this and I'm now I'm going to set the port we want to actually run on for our API server and set our profile for our Docker Compose to not always spin up a new browser. So I'm going to copy my port selection and paste it here. And this, what this will do is it will take the internal Docker port of 80 and the internal Docker port of 443 and bind it to 5400 on our actual machine itself. And I'm also going to click properties here. And I'm going to tell it to 
do nothing, which means that it will no longer launch a browser every single time. Obviously, you can configure it to whatever you would like. And you can also configure the port and the default um, HTTP protocol that you want as well. So next, uh, you click OK. And now we're going to run it again. And we're going to verify that the port selection has actually um, affected our change. So let's go to a browser. And I'm going to go HTTPS, localhost. I'm going to go 5401. And then we're going to go weather forecast. And this should return our results. So now we have our port set up in the right place. And that is the end of part two. I hope you guys learned a little bit about how to set up Docker, your Docker Compose file in Visual Studio. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, like this video. And if you have any feedback, leave it in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next time.